Howdy, Immortalium here, and today I'm going to be reviewing Dream Fossil by Satoshi Kon. Just before I start reviewing this, I just really want to point out the fact that I'm a big, big Satoshi Kon fan. I've seen Paranoia Agent, I've seen My Am Actress, Toka Godfathers, and Paprika. I've yet to see Perfect Blue, which is something I want to remedy in the near future. Uh, so of course, when I heard that uh, Satoshi Kon's manga was getting translated into English, I was overjoyed. Um, he started out as a mangaka before uh, becoming a film director, so I was really excited to be able to see how he developed his storytelling style, how he developed his artistic style, etc, etc. And what's particularly interesting about this work is that this is actually a collection of one-shots that he did uh, from 1984 to 1989. Most of them were published in Young Magazine. There was a couple of other magazines that, you know, a couple of these stories got published in, uh, but it was mostly Young Magazine. Now, because of the fact that this is a short story collection, I can't do my usual thing of telling you what the story is and discussing the characters, etc., etc. Uh, so let's start off by discussing the styles of stories. So something that surprised me quite a bit with this work is that a lot of these stories are actually slice of life. There's baseball ones, there's, you know, road trip ones, there's one where um, it's a group of boys trying to lose their virginity one night, which quite surprised me because what I associate with Satoshi Kon is the kind of slice of life, but it's use of somewhat paranormal, supernatural uh, kind of uh, outlying the entire story. So it did surprise me to see, um, you know, so much slice of life in this work. Uh, now there's a couple other stories. There's a couple of examples of stories with that supernatural outline where it starts out relatively normal, slice of life, uh, but by the end of the story some kind of supernatural element has been introduced which kind of changes your view on the story, um, which is something that Stoshikon would build on particularly later in his career. There's a couple of sci-fi stories in here, uh, particularly noteworthy were the first story uh, present in this book and the last story um, and then there was actually a historical story there was actually a um, samurai story in here which I thought was a very interesting read um, so there's actually a decent variety of stories in here some that I noted particularly from a storytelling perspective is that Satoshi Kon was really working on his style of comedy here um, just to put it out there I'm a big fan of Tokyo Godfathers, which I find to be absolutely hilarious. Uh, so, you know, I have no issue with that. Um, but I did notice that his style of comedy in his earlier stories were a bit on the kind of normal, angry, you know, punching slapstick style of comedy, which I wasn't too keen on. Um, but as the uh, stories progressed and progressed, that style of, uh, oh my god, I can't believe that happened comedy, uh, started to develop, which I absolutely adored from Satoshi Kon. So it became clear uh, that during the course of these stories, uh, Satoshi Kon began to uh, get a grip on what type of comedy he was good at being able to uh, handle. Uh, so I really, really did enjoy uh, seeing the origin of that. In regards to the quality of the stories themselves, they're a bit hit or miss. That's to be expected from a short story collection. Um, there was a couple of stories that I wasn't really keen on, in particular the two baseball stories. Um, the first story was very quote-unquote comedic, but I wasn't exactly keen on the comedic style of it. It was very slapstick, it was uh, very over-the-top, um, it just didn't really do much for me. The second baseball story didn't really do much for me either, but in that case it wasn't so much comedy as in I didn't really care too much for the drama. But there are some stories that I found really, really interesting, like that road trip one, uh, the one where it's two boys, you know, heading off to, um, you know, a friend's house, and they come across a couple of things on their way. I found really, really interesting and entertaining work. Um, and then, of course, I mentioned the samurai one. The samurai one was really interesting. So, to me, this is a bit of a hit or miss work. To be honest, that's to be expected. This was near the very beginning of Satoshi Kun's uh, career, so it only makes sense that he would make a couple of mistakes in some of these stories. But it does impact my overall enjoyment of the work. Um, maybe to a lesser extent than in most cases because of the fact that even in the stories that I didn't care for too much, I could still see Satoshi Kon's style developing. Uh, so I still found those stories interesting from that regard. It's just that they didn't really do much for me as an actual story. Um, now, from an artistic perspective, I think this is a very, very interesting work because, of course, as I said, it goes from uh, these stories were published between 1984 to 1989. Uh, so, as we can, we can actually see a significant change in his art style when it first of all begins. 
Um, it's interesting to note that he was an assistant to Katsuhiro Otomo uh, for Akira. So it's interesting to note that a lot of his um, earlier stories, in particular, have a very Akira-esque look to them. Uh, now, as time goes on, it actually does develop its own... Well, I should say, it develops a little bit of its own style. I wouldn't say it develops too much of a, of a different style. The story that I found most like his uh, more current style, his uh, style that he did in his anime works, was actually the Samurai story. Um, if I can get to you a couple of examples there, that looks a pretty close to what he would later end up doing artistically. So it's very interesting to see that develop, the change from that Katsuhiro Tomo very heavily influenced uh, to Tsurushi Kon's kind of more, uh, you know, personal style. Now, he does later kind of go back a bit to the Akira-esque look, uh, possibly because maybe he found that a little easier to draw for a little while. Uh, and I did notice that in uh, his first serialization, his first long-term serialization, Tropic of the Sea, which was published after Dream Fossil, it had a very Akira-esque look to it. It is clear that he did end up going back to the style, but it is interesting to note that this um, that the style he would end up later using is actually present in this work. Also to say that there's a lot of variety of uh, art styles in here. There's like the highly detailed ones of the, you know, historical samurai one. Uh, in a lot of the more comedic stories, I noticed there's less detail, a more kind of uh, focus on character movement, which makes a lot of sense, particularly given that a good few of them are relying on slapstick. So very, very interesting from an artistic perspective, and the vast majority of the stories do look very pleasant. Um, I would say that I'm a, a good fan of the art style in general. There's um, a couple of ones that uh, didn't really do too much for me artistically, but those were mostly near the beginning where he was still trying to figure out his art style. In regards to the actual release of this, uh, there's a couple of things I need to mention. So first of all, let's talk about trim size. Uh, it's a little bigger than normal uh, Tonkaban, if I get out of my trusty Yatsuba. Uh, it is approximately this much bigger. So it's a nice bigger release which allows you to be able to see uh, the differences in art style throughout the entire work. Uh, which is very good. Um, beyond that, uh, it's interesting to note that one of the stories is actually in full colour. Uh, it's actually called Picnic. It's very short, it's about 10 pages long maybe, uh, but it's actually done entirely in colour, which I fa I really did adore the uh, use of colour in the story. I, I thought it was one of the best looking uh, colour manga that I've read in a while, um, which is really, really nice. And then the other thing I guess I'd best point out is that uh, some of the stories they couldn't get the original manuscripts for, and so there's a significant difference in look because they had to actually use the magazine release, which of course, as most people would know, the magazine release of manga is generally lower quality. Um, so like just to contrast the, the difference uh, in quality, let's pick up one story that is uh, from the original manuscripts. A good example would be here. So if you take a look at this style, and then if we go to one where they couldn't get the original manuscript back, you will see this, which looks a lot more scratchier. Um, there's a lot more kind of dust particles and all that. It's it's a little on the ugliest side. Now, it was either that or not included at all. And of course, on, the, on that premise, it was well worth, you know, including it, of course. Uh, but it was a little disappointing that they couldn't get the original manuscripts. Uh, there's two other things I want to note. One is actually an interview with Susumu Hirasawa. Uh, basically, Susumu Hirasawa, he was a, um, a uh, musician. He is a musician, I should say, who worked with Satoshi Kon. And he, he spends a, a couple of pages, you know, discussing, um, you know, his uh, experience with Satoshi Kon, what was Satoshi Kon like. Uh, how do you do his films? And of course, there's actually a decent little section talking about the final movie that Satoshi Kon was working on, Dreaming Machine, which uh, is still in production, and who knows whenever it's actually going to get released, because um, not enough uh, storyboards were constructed of it that it could legitimately be called Satoshi Kon's work. So there, it is a bit problematic, but it's very interesting to read that and hear um, you know his thoughts on having met the man. And uh, the last thing I guess I should mention, which is where I was able to mention about, you know, the years and, uh, you know, Young Magazine, is that they actually do have a list here of original publications, you know, it's explaining which stories were released in what magazine and at what time. So, you know, I found that really, really interesting because it allowed you to be able to tell when he had done the story 
and how it was developing. Uh, so, overall, uh, Dream Fossil. What did I think of Dream Fossil? Um, overall, I enjoyed it. Um, there were some very good stories in here. Um, there was a couple of iffy-ish stories, uh, but I definitely found it to be a very interesting work. Um, a big part of that, though, I think, is that because of how much of a fan I am of Satoshi Kon, um, I wonder if uh, you weren't a big fan of Satoshi Kon, would you get as much out of this as I did? It's simply because this is clearly a, um, a guy who was still developing his own style, so you, it's really, really interesting to see Satoshi Kon developing his own style, and if you're not going into that for that, if you're going into it for the quality of its storytelling, I still think you will enjoy it, but you probably won't enjoy it quite as much as I did. And um, so, yeah, if you're a big, big fan of Satoshi Kon, this is a no-brainer. You should pick this up as soon as you can. If you're looking for a short story collection, you could do worse than this. Um, you might find a couple of stories uninteresting, but in most of the cases you're going to find stories that are at the very least interesting, uh, but most of the time very entertaining. Uh, so overall, I do definitely recommend Dream Fossil, mostly to Satoshi Kon fans. Uh, to people looking for short story uh, collections, I can definitely recommend this as well. So that was my review of Dream Fossil. Uh, hopefully you found it entertaining and enlightening. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to comment, rate, subscribe, and bye-bye.